thank you everyone for taking your time out to join us this morning to have a chat with um, Linda Gale Becker. So colleagues, I'll just give you an overview of the call today. This call is brought to you by the Vaccine Advocacy Resource Group, which is a group that is 100% funded by activists. It is also brought to you by the African Alliance with support from the South African Medical Research Council and the Department of Science and Innovation. Today, we're going to speak to Linda Gale Becker. We're going to hear her thoughts on the work that the foundation is doing in general, um, hear a bit more about the change in the foundation's name and what that means, and also hear about how the advent of COVID-19, if it has at all impacted the work of the foundation and what new and potential work is coming up um, in the foundation. Once we've heard that overview, colleagues, we'll then get into a Q&A session. We'll cover some of the pre-submitted questions and then we'll go straight on to the questions that you submit via chat. So once again, thank you, Linda Gale, for joining us and over to you. Thank you, Tian. It's always a pleasure uh, to meet with uh, community at large, and I know that that includes a variety of different stakeholders, um, but it's always a pleasure to make contact, and, and thank you to Varg uh, for the work you do, um, and uh, reliant on you as the days and months unfold, because I'm absolutely sure that, as always, activists have an, a critical role in, um, and advocates have a critical role uh, in the work we do um, and better health for the nation at large. So I um, am thrilled to be given this opportunity to talk a little bit about the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation. Quite correct, we've just recently undergone a change in that strategic H, which used to stand for HIV, now stands for health. And, and I think it's important to explain why we have made that change. But let me back up a little bit um, just to talk uh, a bit about who we are and what we do. Um, so the, the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation is um, has a vision overall to lessen the impact of the HIV epidemic and related conditions on individuals, families and communities. And this is important through our commitment to excellence, innovation and our passion for humanity. And of course, we, we follow closely in the footsteps of our patron. And you'll know that we've strategically used some of the words he would use, um, that being Emeritus Desmond and Pilo Tutu. Our pursuit of excellence is in research. Um, and through that research, we try to understand better treatments, better prevention, better ways of managing HIV and related infections in South Africa. And I'm gonna pause for a moment just to say what our values are because they mean a lot to me and I know they mean a lot to everyone in the organization. Uh, we include passion, which includes compassion, uh, excellence, uh, integrity, innovation, progress, and respect. Quite a mouthful, uh, but we think we have uh, big shoes to fill. And, um, you know, uh, it's important to really pay attention to each one of those. Now, what people may not realize is that we're actually two organizations in one. On the one hand, we're the Desmond Tutu HIV Center, which sits firmly within the University of Cape Town. And that's where Robin, myself, Catherine, other senior investigators are professorial. So we, we have our academic affiliation there. And uh, there we teach postgraduate students. Uh, we try to build capacity around research as an endeavor and academia as at large. But very importantly, we have a sister or brother, whichever gender you prefer, maybe non-binary gender organization that we hold hands with called the Desmond Tutu, up until about a month ago, HIV Foundation, now known as the Health Foundation. And this provides infrastructural development. We are totally against parachute research, whatever you wanna call that terminology. We believe in order to do solid, uh, community-based uh, research that includes good participatory practice, we need to be firmly placed within communities. And so it is the foundation that creates that community space for community development, community partnership, uh, community 
collaboration um, and, and really uh, excellence around community engagement. So the foundation is the, if you like, the, the, the machinery in which uh, the, the excellence in research can exist. Uh, we have a large organization. It grows and shrinks depending on what we're doing. A few uh, a year ago, we were very involved in a big global fund project, which really expanded our ranks uh, to about 350. Currently, we're sitting around uh, 300 individuals, about 125 people in the center, and 125 people in the foundation. We are predominantly women. Womandla, um, and we obviously care a lot about transformation. So we really are trying to build capacity in our ranks through mentorship, through career pathing, but also just through those soft skills of, of individual development. Um, and all of that needs to happen whilst we do our research. This is a team effort. It involves many, you know, fantastic people who have skills in finance, in IT, uh, all the way through to HR, and then the sort of clinical healthcare worker research types uh, who are absolutely key to our endeavor. We have six sites uh, around the Western Cape and most recently, very proudly, a site in Buffalo City in the Eastern Cape. Uh, and then, of course, many of you will be aware of our mobile fleet, the brightly colored rainbow trucks, uh, some of which are dedicated to adolescents called the Tutu Teen Trucks, others to men, Amajita Men's Truck, others more generally the Tutu Testers and the Tutu Quick Tests. Um, all of them are talking to health screening and promotive health. So we want to see a healthier South Africa, healthier adolescents, healthier adults. Um, and we think that that requires promotional approaches. Uh, so our sites, again, are down in the South Peninsula at Masi. We have a site in Guguletu at Hrutuskir Hospital in Philippi Village uh, and in Emma Vundleni in Crossroads. Um, to just name a few. And then finally, uh, very excited about Buffalo City BCM in East London. Again, just quickly to make people aware, we have two other big research groupings attached to us within our ranks. The one uh, heads up the clinical trials unit, and I'll come back to that because that is about to do an enormous amount of work in COVID. So that is closely linked to uh, the NIH in America. It gets a lot of its funding and a lot of its work from the networks that are associated with the Division of AIDS at the National Institute of Health. So that includes our vaccine work, our prevention, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis work, and of course our treatment work uh, around TB and HIV and other modalities. So the clinical trials unit has six clinical research sites doing uh, a lot of work. And as I say, I'll come back to that because COVID has very much moved into that space. We have another big grouping called the aerobiology unit. And Again, listeners may not be absolutely familiar with this, but this is the work to understand the transmission of aerosol transmitted diseases. Now that becomes very relevant, of course, in the, in the era of COVID, but up until now, focus has been largely on tuberculosis. Um, and we have built a BL3 lab. That means a lab that can conduct really high level microbiological research down in Masapumaleli. Um, and again, very proud that we want to have a footprint in community. Um, and that is a beautiful building now called the uh, Masapumaleli Aerobiology Unit. It's uh, headed up by Robin Wood, who really is making unbelievable strides, if I can say uh, immodestly, uh, in understanding how TB and other airborne uh, diseases are transmitted from one individual to another. You, you may be surprised to hear that we did not know this about tuberculosis. We have very little understanding. It's a hundred years old, it's, a, it's an ancient disease, but we still have no idea of how TB is actually transmitted. So important that that work is ongoing. In the last few minutes, we have organized our foundation into divisions. So we have an HIV treatment division, prevention, tuberculosis, men's health, very important, women and maternal health. We have a large group working on adolescent health, 
on sexual health, on key pops, particularly men who have sex with men and transgender women. Uh, we have underpinning all of that a, a strong socio-behavioral science group, and then finally our mobile services. So you may ask, why have we changed our name? Well, there are two reasons, and this has been in the works for about three years now. The one was that for a long time, communities have told us that they are worried about the sort of stigmatization that comes with having HIV front and, and, and uh, you know, center in our work. And we understand uh, that that is real. Uh, there was a time when we, um, you know, wanted HIV to be, I suppose, somewhat in the center because we wanted people to focus on it specifically and unapologetically. We wanted to normalize it as much as possible, but adolescents in particular have really shied away from the name. And so we have over the number of years now kind of dropped the IV and just spoken about DTHF. And then many of you may have read the commission that the IAS and, um, and the Lancet uh, commissioned in 2018, which spoke about HIV starting to find global cause with uh, global health, or, you know, good cause with global health in general. So positioning HIV more broadly within a global health agenda, especially as universal health access has come into the fore again, um, as we've spoken more about HIV being more integrated with other conditions and other diseases. And it is for this reason that the foundation has now taken the step to say, we want to put our mouths where our beliefs are. HIV does not go off the table. It's squarely back on the table, but within a broader mandate. And so we actually, you know, got the board's permission, our board's permission to do this six months ago, even before COVID arrived. But actually now that COVID is on our doorstep, it even makes more sense that we have a Desmond Tutu health focus. And, I, and our mission has not changed. HIV is a driver of poor health in this country, as is TB, as are the related conditions. So we have to continue. Our work is not done in HIV and TB. We have to continue to work there, but we will bring these other issues along with us. Health systems, understanding how these new modalities, so we innovate. How do we bring those innovations into a health system that has work to do? There is no doubt that, um, you know, figuring out how to strengthen and make our health system resilient whilst adopting these new innovations is a large body of work that many of us need to engage in. And we are privileged to be a group that can contribute to that. So, COVID is amongst us and on us. Uh, so what have we done? Well, first of all, I think we recognized that there was, a, especially as the lockdown happened, we looked north, we saw what was happening. We saw this unprecedented public health response where people have really focused in a very um, concentrated way on a single disease. We quickly realized there was a terrible danger that other health priorities, such as HIV and TB, were in grave danger of falling off the table. So we have been really, I suppose, uh, somewhat um, annoyingly, I think, a nag about making sure that TB and HIV is not forgotten in all of the focus and extreme attention on COVID-19. We understand why there is that attention, but I think we there's a very serious lesson that we have to learn, that we have to approach these things in a more integrated, more uh, comprehensive way in case we run into the danger of losing handle on other serious disease priorities. I'm talking about TB and HIV, but of course, child health critical at this time. If we have an outbreak of measles now because people are not immunizing their children with MMR, we are going to be, you know, years set back in terms of well-being and, and, and the advances we've made. So we've got to 
recognize our, our situation here in LMICs where we don't have just one thing to think about. We've got to think of, about many things. So how do we bring all of those along at the same time? So we have been an advocate for be careful of other things. And, and again, I'm a believer that model behavior is important. So very quickly, brought it to my team, all 300 of them, that we needed to not build our systems around COVID, but bring COVID into our menu of services and systems. And so literally overnight, and, and I'm grateful that you know we, we have resources to do this, we converted all of our sites, all of our services to be COVID ready. That sounds sort of magical, but it's not. It means putting up perspex barriers between receptionists and, and the public. It means changing vehicles so that you have a barrier between the people who you're transporting and the driver to protect the driver. It means importing lots of PPE, which of course we had to do. It means um, quickly putting new work, work practice guidelines in place so that you understand infection control. By the way, we should have been doing this for tuberculosis a, a hundred years ago. Um, and I hope that some of these lessons are going to translate into how we manage teams. Um, but really bringing those infection control measures home and making sure every staff member understands their risk, uh, what they need to do and how they can protect themselves. And then, of course, making sure that the public understand how they can still interact with us safely in order to get the job done. So that had to happen. And of course, all our research was stopped. Um, again, understand the, the response, but we had to get all that machinery going again. So that is about convincing, reassuring individuals who hold themselves responsible that we could do this safely. So it, it has taken a bit of time, but we've been able to get these, these systems moving again. And I'm pleased to say all of our research that was going on before is now back on the road and, and working well. And of course, the last piece is we know we have to pivot to bring answers to COVID as well. We have the infrastructure, we have the expertise, we have the moral obligation. And so we've put ourselves out there to say we can do COVID research. And so that will include both clinical trials, which we are very good at, um, and our investigator health service research. So I'll give you some examples of the health service research we're doing. We're about to start a, um, I think, a, a, an important uh, epidemiological and uh, interventional uh, project in Cape Town, where we will follow a household, and there are 120 households in all, we'll follow a household where there is an individual who uh, willingly and with their own consent uh, puts themselves forward to understand transmission from that individual who's known to be COVID positive to other members of the household and beyond. So how does that transmission work in, COVID, in crowded environments? As we know, COVID is spreading in Africa now through really crowded settings where physical distancing may not be very feasible. So how do we monitor that and understand that? And then we're bringing in a, um, we're bringing in a, um, an intervention to see how we can mitigate risks in crowded environments. So how do we reduce transmission by bringing structural things such as shielding, um, infection control, better information. How do we get that information out to communities through peers? Uh, so that is something we're calling a trace. We have another thing called Buddy, the Buddy Project, where we're looking at adolescents living with HIV, getting their ARVs to them by Uber. So making sure that if they wish to have their antiretrovirals delivered to them, it comes to them in a courier system, uh, number one. And number two, we stay in touch via social media. So we're very worried about mental health as we move to uh, multi-month uh, packages for people living with HIV. They, don't, they may not have contact 
with their healthcare providers, which often is a mental health support. And so we're setting that, that up for adolescents. Just two examples. There are others of the sort of investigator driven. And then maybe what this group wants to hear is, of course, the vaccines are coming and prophylaxis is coming and already early treatment is upon us. So we have some, I think, very exciting uh, projects looking at early treatment for COVID, other projects looking at seroprevalence for COVID, uh, prophylaxis for COVID, particularly for healthcare workers, um, and then finally the vaccines, very important part of, uh, of the next phase of the response. Um, and we're gearing up now to start some COVID vaccine trials. As you all know, the CHIMPAD uh, trial is already underway in South Africa, but there are a great number more vaccine trials on the card. So I'll stop there, Tian. I hope that hasn't been too much of a mouthful, um, but uh, you know, both challenging, uh, but also exciting times uh, that we're in at the moment. I think it's been really helpful and interesting. Thank you so much, Linda Gale. I think from what you said, um, I mean, a few things stood out, especially the issues of making sure that as a collective, we don't lose these investments that we've made over the decades um, around HIV and TB. Um, and I mean, kudos to you and your team in terms of the rapid turnover of the adjustments in the workplace and with your team. Um, the TRACE project as well is interesting and we'll be engaging with you on that because obviously as you speak the immediate thing that comes to mind is oh my gosh what are the ethics around this you know um especially when you could potentially literally be witnessing the transmission and what is your role as a researcher and your responsibilities as researchers etc cetera, etc cetera. um one thing i did want to touch on based on what you had said around mental health is could you unpack what mental health support are you providing as the foundation to your teams what support and resources are there? We see burnout in many cases re resulting in suicide. We're seeing an increasing amount of suicide amongst NGO workers um, on the front line. What support is there for the DTHF team to access in terms of their own mental health? Tian, you're absolutely right. And again, um, we are, you know, really coming to terms with all of this as we as we move along. So the the fascinating or the challenging thing about COVID is just how everything, I, I don't like the word warp speed because of the administration that thought of it. Um, and I, the association in my mind isn't great. Um, but, but it really has been warp speed. I mean, it is actually a good term in terms of, you know, just it's been unprecedented how quickly everything's had to move. Um, and there really is no time for cogitation and uh, and maybe that's also contributing to the sense of anxiety and mental health uh, you know uh, challenges that are out there but but let me say that um the we've had to move very quickly to understand what the implications are so the first thing is the first question everybody asks is, am I at risk? And clearly, you know, that, that's that been becoming apparent over the last six months, uh, who really is more at risk than others. And the age is is undeniably a, a big factor here. And of course, we, we, we're we a transformed organization. We employ all kinds of individuals, uh, all ages, and also all kinds of status in terms of both comorbidity as well as living with HIV and not and and some are openly and some are not openly living with HIV um, so of course understanding the individual risk was important so we did a person by person assessment literally obviously with the individual's permission to what is your what is your status as an employee in the space of COVID so that was important to categorize everybody uh, we then created these sort of buckets who can go back to work safely who needs to work from home but in uh you know in a different capacity who can come back to work but has to be upstairs away from the public how do we get people to and from work safely all of those things had to, so you have to do the physical logistical stuff right to reassure then you have to stay in touch all the time so throughout the lockdown we literally had a daily COVID news flash um, and hats off to Man Latif, our communications officer who, you know, single-handedly managed this. And she always had a mental health kind of 
thing there. Um, you know, remember guys to breathe, remember to take a break from your screen, remember to, to, you know, hug your, somebody in your family. I love the Korean system. They, they've come out with messaging to say physical distancy, but you can hug somebody in your home, um, by the way. So, you know, they, they, and of course, to remember there are individuals who are living alone. So, so that those people particularly, maybe you can send a virtual hug to. So that was the other thing is stay in touch. We've now reduced that to weekly just because it can also be overload and there's an unbelievable amount of information coming in via social media, but important communications key. I try to stay in touch because I am seen as, as, as a figurehead and I recognize that. So I try to every now and then without being painful, send out information and, and updates on how we're doing, what we're managing, et cetera. With my leadership team, I have a weekly COVID response meeting. So again, there it is to hear from the ground up as well as from me down uh, what, you know, what, so communication, let me stop there. That is absolutely key. We've just recently also had a survey amongst the staff, both anonymous and, and, and non-anonymous, again, depending on the individual's choice, to just get a temperature check in the organization. We've asked things like, what's your anxiety level? So again, check in, see where people are, what's, what's the feeling on the ground, are there particular cadres or particular sites where people are really struggling? So that's the other piece. And then we've tried to put resources at people's disposal. So we have an internal staff counselor within our organization. He is, you know, 24 seven available to staff. Um, and we have also uh, other resources outside of that individual at, at the disposal of staff. So I guess, you know, we, we are aware that you can still be very mentally distressed on your own. And, uh, and so line are also told, please check in. If you're not hearing from someone, track them down, find them, see why they may not be responding. And of course, if anybody gets sick, and I will say we have had individuals get sick within our ranks, all of them not in the workplace, interestingly, all have been, uh, have, have, contracted their COVID elsewhere. Um, and sadly, to date, we have had one, uh, one staff member pass away as a result of COVID. So, the, you know, and, and I've been very aware that that really hit the staff hard, and we've tried to give as much support as possible. So, not to forget this important component. So, thank you for raising it. Great. Thanks for that. Um, I think it's really assuring it's reassuring to know that at least in the foundation staff do have access um, to that therapy and support and intervention um, when and if they need it. Um, Linda Gale, I'd like now to speak a bit more specifically on the vaccine trials that the um, foundation will be moving ahead with. Um, there was some talk a few weeks ago around a trial called Crown Coronation, um, we know WRHI was um, involved in that, and so was the foundation. Could you share any updates or thoughts on how that trial is progressing, if at all? Yes. So, um, again, just to remind everyone, we did have this uh, a similar webinar to try and engage uh, folk and, and give them information. So, this Crown Coronation is a four. Just to remind everyone, it's a four continent. Uh, collaborative, I suppose is the best word, led by um, a, an anaesthetist, a very uh, smart guy who's done, actually ex-South African, interestingly, who's based in St. Louis uh, in the US. Um, and he is joined by a, a co-PI in the UK, and then Helen Rees is the other co-PI. Um, and this was to try and repurpose an already existing agent so that we could move quickly uh, as pre-exposure prophylaxis. So if I can use, and I know not everybody will love this, but if I could use the analogy that in HIV we have condoms and we, you know, that has been the cornerstone of our response for prevention of HIV are, are, are the male and female condoms, but we know that those fail sometimes or they're not available or they can't be accessed. 
Um, and then we've come in with this thing called oral prep, um, oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. And of course, we're now trying to find uh, injectable prep. And again, I can't help but spread information that Cabotegrava LA now is, is, is approved. And the vaginal ring also uh, very, well, it's not approved, but it's, it, it's worked. The, the LA, and of course the vaginal ring is now um, EMA approved. So we have other prophylactic agents. So for when a condom fails. So the analogy in COVID is we have PPE, right? We can we can physically distance, we can provide ventilation, and we can provide N95 masks for healthcare workers. Um, but sometimes those aren't available, or they get missed or they don't work, uh, and so is there something else we can offer, hence the prophylaxis. And our first stab at this was chloroquine. There was a lot of promise about hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, but again, in an incredibly quick, and there was very good scientific evidence, uh, uh, sort of associated evidence that this could be a, a highly effective prophylactic agent. As it happens, that more and more data has come out to suggest that even if there is some effect, it's going to be so marginal that it's not, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. So we have decided as a collaborative that we have to stop chloroquine. Now, we were poised to go. So we've had to pull everything back and we've gone back to the drawing board to say what else is out there. And we now have quite a list of potential agents that could be prophylactic based on how they work in the lab, they work on other SARS type illnesses, etc. Leading amongst them at the moment is this concept of using a, another kind of vaccine which stirs up the immune system in an innate non-specific way and gets our own good old immune systems to get revved up to take out invading pathogens of which COVID may be one and which is the most prevalent at the moment. So where I'm going with this, and, and I think the, this forum and, uh, and other forums will be hearing more about this. I don't want to sort of steal the thunder of the South African PIs. It's Bruce Picard and, and Sinead Delaney Moraletwa. Um, but just to tell you what this, the, 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 the new news out of the box is, uh, the, the vaccine MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, looks like in the, in the test tube, in other uh, ecological research, looks very promising that it can have this role. Um, and as I say, we can do another webinar with much more detail, but to tell the people on this call now that we are pursuing whether the MMR vaccination, now this is to adults, uh, as a booster, could well be a prophylactic measure that could get the health uh, the immune system geared up to fight COVID if COVID is encountered. So that is where we are at the moment with Crown. Great, thanks so much, Linda Gale Becker. So for colleagues on the call, um, some of the initial um, thinking we had done around um, the MMR vaccination is that you recall in June 2020, we heard that scientists from Lithuania and Kurdistan had come up with a suggestion that traditional childhood vaccines against measles, mumps, and rubella MMR may be able to protect children from COVID-19. But now, Linda Gale, you had said adults. And yes, I understand. I won't probe further because um, we'll get Sinead on um, and she can, you know, talk us through that. But it's certainly very interesting um, and we'll keenly be watching that space. Um, so, I wonder Tia, Tia, now I would just say to you that I think, you know, particularly the child specialists in the country are very worried that we may lose ground on MMR child vaccination as part of the EPI just because of lockdown and, and the sort of disorganization that has followed the COVID response. And so we may get an unintentional additional benefit of herd immunity for MMR by, you know, putting vaccine out there anyway. So I'm, I, I mean, I say that, uh, you know, without any evidence at all uh, and totally speculatively, but that might just be a good side, side issue that, that may emanate from it. Um, 
we'll have to see. We're, we're a little way off uh, initiating. And as I say, I think we'll be wanting to update community at large, certainly before initiation. So we, we're, we're scrambling at the moment just to get these things to regulators so that, uh, you know, it's moving forward as quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. I think it also links to some degree to the discussions we've been having around availability and access of BCG. Um, and so I think I would be amiss if I didn't ask you the following question. What are your thoughts on the current BCG revaccination trials that are happening? Yeah, so you're quite right that it's a similar kind of thinking. Um, I, I'm going to share my own sort of question in my own mind on this one is that we have such a lot of TB infection in this country. So unlike the first world where TB infection is rare, right? Uh, because they have controlled tuberculosis by and large. In this country, TB infection is rife. Um, you know, we know that, I will say this, by the time a child in our communities is five, one in five will have already become infected with TB. By the time they are 15, one in two are infected with tuberculosis. And just about all of our adults, 80% of adults in, in communities, and this is not healthcare workers, these are people in communities, have been exposed and infected with tuberculosis. So we have an enormous force of infection. Hence, my somewhat snide comment about the fact that there's been so much focus on COVID. When we have a airborne disease that we've kind of ignored um, and lived with for a really long time that claims, you know, almost 80,000 South Africans every year and sends them to their, to their graves. Um, nevertheless, here we are. Um, so with that force of infection, I'm surprised that we wouldn't be benefiting from almost boosting our BCG on a regular basis because of the infection of TB. So I, I scratch my head a little bit around the rationale for the BCG uh, because we have such a lot of circulating mycobacteria already. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of surprised that the antigen would be seen as novel by our bodies. So that was the one question in my own mind, but I'm, I'm out of my... Uh, you know, I'm, I, I haven't delved into it as deeply, perhaps, as those who are leading the studies may have. Um, so I do think, uh, and then, you know, I think you raise a very good point about how much of the vaccine is available in the world, and are we, are we in danger of removing it from people who really need it for that explicit disease's needs? Now, I think you raised a very real concern a few months ago. Do we have enough BCG in the world? Because there was some shortage. Um, to my knowledge, I don't think there's any shortage of MMR, uh, luckily, and we have looked into that. And there are at least two, uh, or, you know, pharma that provide it in this country alone. So, and they have not indicated any anxiety about uh, being able to lay hands on sufficient vials. So, so you know, I think we have done due diligence around the availability of MMR. Great, thanks for that. So we have a question in the chat. Um, colleagues, please feel free to continue putting questions and thoughts um, and comments into the chat. Ntombo Zukokrai asks, um, the body project in terms of delivery of art in these homes will be slightly difficult. Do you think a parental waiver will be important? Yeah, so, um, and I've, uh, I see Kathy's on, on the call, so she might want to weigh in. Um, she's my go-to, uh, her and Anne are my Havig um, ethical go-to gurus um, on this, and they've written such an amazing amount of work about uh, children's involvement in, in research. So we are trying to follow some of, of the principles we've learned from them and others over the years. Um, the, the problem with kids who live with HIV often is that there isn't a legal guardian or if, the, you know, just by the nature of the thing, there often isn't that 
availability. So we never want to leave those individuals out. So the way we've approached this is not necessarily needing a legal guardian's uh, consent, but at least having the consent of somebody in the home uh, who is adult, um, whether that's a caregiver or somebody who's older, recognizing that there may be unintentional uh, stigma related to um, to bringing antiretrovirals into the home. Um, secondly, obviously, the, the these are older adolescents; they're not children, um, so so they have autonomy, and they have a right to their own health, and 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 they certainly we believe they should be transitioning to managing their own situation, their own condition. So there is a discussion with that individual. Who do they want to involve? How do they want to involve them? Um, and then, you know, obviously trying to use our principles of informed consent as carefully as we can. Recognizing that in this country, adolescents are not recognized to be able to provide consent uh, legally. Uh, but this is where, again, working closely with ethics and with community, uh, we have been able to, sorry about the dog in the background, I'm not quite sure what's going on. Um, we have been able to work with individuals um, to, to understand, you know, that tension between the right of that individual who's transitioning to adulthood uh, versus the full embodiment of legality and, and coming of age. So the, these are meaty topics um, and we, together with our ethics committee, work very closely with our community advisory boards to understand what is acceptable, what is not acceptable um, and what can be done safely. Um, recognizing also that good participatory practice requires the adolescents to weigh in. So we, we try to do all of the above uh, when we do that. But you're absolutely right there. They, if done ham-fistedly, um, it can cause a great deal of harm. So our principle is first do no harm. Um, uh, but I do think this is an important area to research, how we can reach out to adolescents when physical contact is not possible, such as we've just experienced with, with the COVID lockdown. Thank you for those reflections. Um, I think Yvette is also sharing um, on the chat that I agree that neglecting HIV and TB will be a disaster. We've seen the very first case of fatality of this with a comrade in Uganda dying because she could not access her TB treatment since the lockdown. And it's an example of how real this can get. And I know the Clinician Society and some other groups have, have done increasing work in South Africa in terms of how the pandemic is really affecting uptake, it's affecting adherence, it's affecting um, very basic public health care services um, and being provided. Um, Blossom also speaks about the urgency um, and are we doing enough to reach communities at grassroots levels and Blossom touches on stigma and misconceptions. We've learned a significant amount to say the very least around stigma and misconceptions um, in our work around HIV and TB. What are your reflections and your thoughts on the route that stigma could take in the context of COVID, specifically your thoughts around its similarity in terms of how it was initially presented to the public with TB, in terms of coughing, difficulty of breathing, and, and, and. Do you think there are any specific issues we need to keep top of mind when we start thinking, or when we continue thinking around stigma when it comes to COVID in particular? Yeah, um, and you know, I think the, the, the issue here, the common factor in all of this is the notion of infectiousness, right? So it's the contagion. It's the you can cause the disease in other people and whether I feel it internally that I can infect others or whether others accuse me of, of being the infecting agent. And, and this is where, you know, I, I, I even reflected a little bit about a, a tweet I saw the other morning and I didn't read the whole context, but I understand our, our head of health sort of was quoted as saying that the Cape Town COVID epidemic was seeded from Europe. And I reflected on that for a moment and thought, you know, I wonder why he felt 
or why the headline, and I'm not saying he felt he needed to say that, but why the headline picked up on that. Because somehow we always want to find the source, right? We want to lay blame. Um, and I, feed, I think that feeds into stigma. I think good news now that we're moving away from saying mother to child transmission, because that immediately fingers the mother, doesn't it? Um, uh, when we say, you know, when we ask somebody living with HIV, how did you get it? I mean, to my mind, you know, unless there's a medical biological reason to know, why do we care how somebody actually got their, their, their infection? Um, you know, and, and I think all of those ideas feed into stigmatization. And of course, that's where COVID comes is, if I've got the disease, where did I get it from? And because of our contact tracing approach, I think that really underpinned the who gave it to who. And, and I'm very aware that even in our, our trace uh, research, uh, you know, there's a grave danger there, like who passed it on to who? So granny dies, who, who brought it into the home because now granny is demised, you know? So there's huge potential for blame. Um, and I think too often our public health messaging is one of naming and blaming, shaming people. You know, again, how do we get people to change their behavior by bringing out the positive social value of doing something rather than shaming and blaming? So I'll, I'll never forget, you know, that morning after lockdown, when all the people were out on the Seapoint Boulevard getting fresh air. Um, and I felt like the whole rest of the country was, you know, furious with Cape Town because they all moved and did what we do, which is, you know, walk and cycle and, we, we, you know, we're unstoppable in that regard. But that, that, that kind of immediate, you know, shaming thing when maybe the other thing is to really look at positive public health messaging to get people to change behavior for positive reasons so as not to feed the stigma that immediately follows when you know when there's a negative connotation um, and so yes i think the shared problem that hiv tb stis um, and and covid have is just this who made me sick um, how did I get this thing? Um, and, and, and everything that goes with it. Yeah. Thanks for that. I know we have about just over 10 minutes left. Um, so thank you, Kathy, for adding um, into the chat. I agree with Linda Gale that we need a broad range of consent approaches to enable adolescents to benefit from scientific advances. I think um, we're in agreement on that. It was interesting to hear you speak Linda Gale about contact tracing and the potential for that to perhaps fuel stigma. And it's certainly something um, that we've been thinking about. Linda Gale, as we reach the top of the hour, I wondered your thoughts around how do you, in the time of COVID, process personally what at least appears, in our view, to be a rise in anti vaxxer an anti-vaxxer movement and anti-research, anti-science sentiment. We know that the discourse has largely been focused um, on Gates and what that potentially means. Um, and we've heard all sorts of theories from there's a microchip planted in the vaccine to this is population control to they want to kill our babies um, and, and, and. And this includes very high profile politicians. Um, what would you... What are your reflections on that? Because I know certainly we've had a lot of discussions around this and we certainly feel that in many cases, we're not resourced enough to take on what at least appears to be a significantly resourced, polished machine. And then at the other end of it, it appears not to be that at all. So we had the anti-vaxxer march outside Bits a few weeks ago, and it was a really small march of a few folks. It didn't get much media traction, but we certainly reached out to them and we said, how can we engage? Because at some point, and this is my totally personal view, I feel we also need to take ownership of how much work have we done to ensure we infiltrate the anti-vaxxer space and see at the very least, could we, for lack of a better word, convert a quarter 
of that group just purely on presenting the science and not even science, just basic facts. You saw how, you saw how they ran with this Oxford trial is on Africans. This Oxford trial is on Africans, but the headline clearly said South Africa, Brazil, UK, it was clearly not just in Africa. And at least we know in our context, the Oxford trial, we spoke to Pr Professor Mahdi two weeks ago on, on the same call where he unpacked how South Africa approached the UK, how him and his team had to go and fundraise for this trial to happen, but yet it's been packaged. And of course, we know there's a historical context to these discussions, a context of white supremacy, a context of colonialism, a context where participants have not always been at the center of research. So what are your thoughts when you see the seemingly uptake in the anti-vaxxer movement? Yeah, I think, Tian, you've touched on, on just fantastic thoughts here. I would just recommend people follow a, a person who I think writes fa really wonderful stuff about this, doing really nice work, is Heidi Larson at the London School. Um, she really has taken on, she, she very much focuses on HPV, but, you know, vaccines at large, and she's taken this on as a, as a life mission. Um, so if, if anybody's looking to read some good stuff, then, and, you know, really seek out Heidi Larson's uh, work. Um, I think you're absolutely right. We have to understand this machine is funded at the highest level by highly well-resourced individuals. And that for me is the most um, sinister of all because, you know, there's politics at the back of that and the agenda is much bigger than all of us uh, in that regard. So I agree that that needs, you know, work at, at the sort of highest level that may be out of touch for all of us. I think, and this is the response I take, is that I am doing what you're suggesting, is those people who sit on the fence, um, they, they're not well informed, uh, they can be tipped towards what sounds like a, you know, a, a prop, propaganda always has an element of truth, right? Or a conspiracy theory might have some nub of truth in it. So they get tipped in that direction with that. Um, and then they fall into that category. How, you know, can we pull them back with good evidence and good information? And my own response is that is all I think I can do is really, um, you know, work on that group of individuals to flood good information. I, I hesitate to take on the really sort of wacko, uh, full-on conspiracy theorists, um, you know, to because often you find yourself in this sort of polarized, almost uh, irrational situation where you get pulled down a rabbit hole and before long, you know, you're not even sure where the conversation's going anymore. So I think my rule of thumb is stay on the hard ice, what you know, what evidence you have, keep bringing back that and appeal to the rationality in those individuals who've not yet completely converted. I, you know, I, it may sound a bit defeatist, but I think there are individuals who need to just, and hopefully they are the minor fringe who are gone. Um, I'm seeing somebody who's getting a lot of publicity now in the States with some really out there theories. And again, sadly, you know, a powerful person in America is going down the road of, of feeding into that stuff. They thrive on that. There's another, you know, there's the 15 seconds of fame side of that. And that is not grounded in good research. It's not grounded in, this is not around cultural beliefs or that this is just, you know, really um, snake oil kinds of, of beliefs and thinking. We had Roth here years ago, many of, maybe everybody here is not old enough to remember, but you know, he was a well-resourced, highly intelligent human being who was nefarious in what he, he, he pushed. 
um, and, and, and pulled some unsophisticated individuals in with him. Now, we could have rescued some of those unsophisticated individuals with good information. Uh, when I say unsophisticated, I don't mean unintelligent at all. They're highly intelligent, just not hands-on on solid information. We can transmit solid information and help those individuals you know, make up better, better minds and better decisions. So that, I don't know, others may have better, I think it's, it's an incredibly challenging space. Um, others may have other ways of dealing with it. That, that certainly is my approach. Uh, my favorite hashtag is vaccines work <laughs> and I yeah. drop it all over the place uh, because I really believe it. Uh, this world is, we, you know, we're seeing longevity like we've never seen before. And that is absolutely due to vaccinology. Um, do I think we're going to, you know, treat and PPE our way out of the COVID response? Probably not, unfortunately. How do I see an end to, to COVID? Probably with a prophylactic vaccine. So, so this is where, um, you know, we have to keep believing in this and giving it our full support. I know I'm talking yeah. to the converted here, so <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also compelled us um, to start thinking out of the box. Um, and of course, the challenge then is to secure resources to do that innovative work. Um, I know at least from the point of view of, of the VARG and its partners, we've started thinking about ethical hacking and what that could mean to take down these problematic posters. Um, we've certainly had re relationships with vice presidents at Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram to really see how we can, whilst we also know we can't deal with every single one because the volume, I personally, the few years I've been doing this work, the last 20 years, I've never seen this sheer volume of information. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, it's quite yeah. staggering. Um, Linda Gale, we have five minutes left on this call. I'm going to ask you in one minute each to answer the following um, questions or give your response. Yvette would like to know, how long do you think it will take us to access the Depivirine ring? <laughs> Ah, oh, Yvette, from your mouth to God's ears. Um, I hope not long. Uh, I've been in touch with Zida Rosenberg directly, obviously. Um, she tells me that they're in manufacture as we speak. So that's the good thing is, well, we have rings. Um, and I'm understanding they are making them even as we speak. So hallelujah to that. Um, I understand the Section 58 thing means that it does move more quickly down the road to our regulators. So um, IPM is going to have to lead that. And I know that they've got um, South Africa in their sights, um, but we now need to engage with SAPRA and, and then with the NDOH. But I'm very pleased to see that I, I'm, you know, God bless them, Hasina and, and uh, Jürgen, who is, does still seem to have a stake in this, even though he's moved on, uh, are interacting around the ring. Uh, so unlike before, where we had to sort of push it into people's faces, I'm pleased to see that it looks like the impetus is, is almost just starting to happen. Um, and, and obviously yourselves, um, together with other organizations such as AVAC, are pushing immediately. Um, so I think, I would like to say that I think it kind of depends on us. How hard do we push? Let's see a civil society agitation for this sooner rather than later so that people feel the pressure from the get-go. Um, I think, yeah. let you know, all, 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 let's go for it. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Nombeko is sharing, in response to the question of stigma, there's so much stakeholder engagement, including online communication with radio stations in trying to reach out to the bigger communities. I'm part of the group reaching out to communities and the questions we get are changing um, to positivity. There's also online WhatsApp support groups I am part of for support reasons and the help in that group is amazing. People join feeling hopeless and with fear. They leave the group feeling motivated. It's understandable that not everyone has access to smartphones, but those who are able to listen to the radio, especially targeting close up speaking individuals in the Eastern Cape are the target. As we know, there's too much traveling between the various provinces. Um, so I think that's an interesting reflection. Um, Linda Gale, I'd like us to wrap up this call um, with your thoughts, what are the top two lessons that, you've, that you have taken away at this stage um, since the advent of COVID? Could you speak to one programmatically and one personally? 
So programmatically, I think I have, it's four words, beware of unintended consequences. Um, you know, I think that when, when the history books get written, there will be a lot of reflection about what we did right, what we did wrong. And again, it's not a naming and blaming thing. It's just to how can we going forward be sure that we make sure we have really thought about all of the unintended consequences. And um, it, it, it's, I'll leave it, it's a little provocative, but maybe all of us can reflect on that always. Our actions may have unintended consequences and we need to get better as a humanity to think when I do this, what is the, what is the other effect other than the thing I was hoping to get? So that would be the one I'm gonna try and myself you know, get better about doing that. And then personally, um, what I have learned from this, I guess, is just how much human beings do need people contact. I, I myself have suffered uh, a great deal. And I think it's because I am a people person, um, not seeing my people regularly, not, uh, you know, the healthcare workers space, now feels quite alienated in that we are constantly on our guard, constantly our patients are, you know, are at a distance. Um, we're constantly aware of, of this new thing. And I'm, I'm surprised because we somehow, you know, got so comfortable with tuberculosis. It's very interesting. Um, but I, but the personal piece here is just, I'm reminded that we are a species that thrives on, on that contact. And, and so I think we have to think through as individuals, is there a, some sort of substitute for that? Is a screen sufficient? What else can we be doing for each other? Or how do we get the resilience within ourselves? Um, but I'm hoping this isn't, you know, going to be a forever thing at all, because I don't think we'll yeah. thrive. Yeah. Thanks for that. I know it's top of the hour. Um, colleagues, as you know, um, any questions or comments that you've put through either by email or in the chat box that we haven't gotten through, we will be reaching out to Linda Gale and her team to answer those questions and get out a post-call report to all of you. Um, the lesson that I take from this, and I love this, Linda Gale, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. That's going <laughs> to stay with me for the rest of the day. Um, colleagues, thank you again for your engagement um, on this one of our weekly Thursday morning webinars. Next week, we speak to Professor Jeremy Nell of the Solidarity Trial, and we also speak to the acting CEO, um, Comrade Mogoduka from the South African National AIDS Council. Um, thank you again, Linda Gale, for your time. We always appreciate the engagements, and we hope this is just one of many more to come. Have a great week, and thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you, Tian. Go well. Thank you.